Welcome to the Gunnersville Grassroots Podcast. Today is June 27th, 2022. My normal co-host, Mr. Trey Swindle, is uh, MIA. Well, actually, I know where he is. He's, uh, per his text, somewhere near the Canada border (laughs) prepping for the uh, Northern Open, which I knew he was going. We weren't sure what his phone service was going to be like. In his place today, I have my good friend and part-time fishing partner when when his other fishing partner will let him loose, uh, uh, Mr. Tom Ott. Uh, Tom and I have been friends for a long time, fished together for a long time, and he's actually been fishing lately, so he may be useful to somebody. But uh, um, We also have, on top of our uh, exclusive guest host over here, we've got, uh, here in a little bit, we've got the district fishery supervisor for the Alabama Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, uh, a gentleman named phil ekema he is a fisheries biologist we're going to see if he'll offer up some uh, good information on the lake uh, ranging from bait to grass to stocking to gill nets and just see what we can get out of him um first off there's not been a whole lot going on tournament wise it's hot it's been real hot been extremely hot you know just start off pat you know i appreciate you letting me step in and trey uh good luck out there uh but uh but yeah, it's been extremely hot. I mean, uh, oppressive. Uh, you know, we went out, uh, had a little nighttime action uh, over the weekend just to kind of beat the heat. And I don't know that it was any cooler than it was <laughs> during the day. You just didn't have the sun on you. So yeah. So you were out at what Friday night? Yes. Friday yes. night. Yeah. Yeah. We fished. Uh, I think right up until about three a.m. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And. A full night, a full night, and you sure. and you got started before before dark, right at eight, yeah. So dusk, dusk, we got out there and uh, just in time to uh, experience uh, no wind and plenty of gnats and that kind of thing. It gets real muggy. So you were telling me a little bit ago, you got bit. I have I experienced something, Pat. I've never ever experienced night fishing, and. Uh, I don't know what it was. Uh, I'm assuming it was some type of flying ant, but we got, uh, it was still, we were sweaty, um, and about 9.30 just got inundated with some giant swarm of uh, ants or something, but uh, they found their way inside my pants and my shirt, <laughs> and uh, so, and then uh, the reason I think they're ants, because fire ants, you know, they seem to bite you all at one time, so, and that's the way it started. But uh, it didn't take me long to uh, shed a few clothes and uh, get those things off of me. <laughs> well, I hate that. Uh, I'm glad I wasn't there, Ooh. but I would have liked to. Other than the part where you're stripping down, taking your clothes <laughs> off from that vice, I would. I would have kind of. I would have kind of liked to seen that. It's kind of funny. Uh, it's a good well, thing you didn't fall in. It was. We almost called it right then. <laughs> you did. Yeah. You, you, you almost just went on to the house. Yes, but uh, uh, took a little boat ride. Uh, stinging went away and uh just kept on fishing so um the uh <laughs> the you said the floating grass was special oh it was unreal uh you know that's some of the questions that, that i can't wait to to get with phil on but yeah the floating grass was just uh unruly i mean uh and you know especially at night you don't have a lot of light so you can't see the grass out there you're just fishing going through the motions and trying to make sure you touch in the bottom but yeah it, it seemed like it'd take you 10 15 minutes to figure out that you weren't doing any good yeah. I'm, I'm not a night fisherman ne- never really have you know me i like to go to bed about nine <laughs> tens late um what are you using at night when you're out there fishing i'll be honest with you you know uh i grew up doing some night fishing and guys would always say you know fish real slow and then when you feel like you're slow enough then slow down some more and that's how you catch fish at night and, and you know maybe some highland smallmouth or something i don't know but uh i fish just like i fish during the daytime um other than you know i like a, a colorado blade on a spinnerbait but uh and i may throw a buzz bait all night but other than that um it took me a little while to dial things in but we were catching them on a worm in the grass on a three eighths ounce you know and a j bug v and m j bug little but, creature bait yeah. little creature bait and just throwing it out there let it hit the bottom work it just like you would you know it was it was crazy and the bite was strong on river channel type stuff yes yeah yes. river not just the bug bites but the not just bites. the bug bites yeah, yeah right <laughs> yeah. The, they yeah. were strong yeah. now you and josh had been on a bit of a tear there for a few weeks back before uh, oh yeah and i'm sure most of that was offshore i know how he likes to fish and how you like to fish um 
Is that is the offshore stuff slowing down for you a little bit? Or, or uh, well, I, you know, I think what's slowed down is you just got so much pressure out there. You just got so much pressure going on out there on the ledges that uh, you know I, I think it just kind of spooks the fish. So. Uh, you had to kind of bounce around a lot more. You couldn't find the big schools like we were. I mean, you know, when the when the fish really hit the ledges, I mean, you know how it is. You oh, they're everywhere. There, but, but absolutely. After about two weeks of getting pounded, and the time right. there was perfect for the pros. The pros came in, and everybody went, "Oh, they're out!" Oh, yeah, <laughs> so, absolutely. They just wrecked them. Uh, it, you know, and it looked like they were struggling, but I, I don't know that they really struggled that much. Well, you know, when you look at the weight between the floating grass and and the current. That's a big I mean, t- you know, they struggled until they didn't. You, Absolutely. You know, that big. grass is really a, you know, that's that floating grass is, it's an equalizer, a game changer, whatever you want to call it, but it equals playing field out a little bit. Hey, a couple a couple of episodes ago, um, I had the winner of that on here, Nick, oh, Nick, Le, Nick yes. LeBrun, so who was standing on up, a tear right now. On too, a tear. Yeah. Went to the James River, which Trey said he didn't like. But uh, went to the James River and won two, two in a row. Over there, yes, two in a row. He he he's really on tear. He's a great guy. And the fourth day, I mean, clutch. Obviously, oh yeah. I mean, he caught a seven pounder uh, at Gunnersville. He caught a five something uh, the last day up there, at James. Yeah, crazy. Yeah, he 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 was on tear. So congrats to him. Uh, he's uh, made a lot of money in the last <laughs> month. So <laughs> definitely, uh, I, I imagine he's been very busy uh, with. Uh, interviews and i don't know what all they do but it was a lot i got lucky to get him because he was driving home the day i talked to him it was the day after he won i just oh, wow yeah well but kevin down at vnm you know is a friend of both ours and i text kevin i said hey what's the chances of me getting him and he goes well here just call him so and he was all over it so um what we're going to do is uh we're going to put you on hold here for a minute see if we can get mr phil Elkema from the state of alabama's department of conservation on here to talk to us and uh See if we can learn something from a man that knows more about fish than either me or Tom. We've got uh, Phil Eckema with the Department of Conservation uh, on here with us. Phil is the District Fisheries Supervisor for the region. Is that correct, Phil? Yeah, you, you cut out, but I, oh. yeah, my name is Phil Eckema. I'm the District 1 Supervisor uh, for the Fisheries Section of the Department of Conservation. And what that entails is the, basically the Tennessee River drainage. And all the reservoirs and creeks and everything that flow into them. Okay, okay. So, 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 what exactly is your daily duty? What What do you do or oversee people doing? Yeah, yeah. As a supervisor, you know, I overlook my um, just two people um, and a secretary. So we're a small staff of four people up here in this district, and we do sport fish management. So crappie. Largemouth, smallmouth, spotted bass, brim, um, stripe, sauger, and and um, and then we also do some non-game work also, but primarily sport fish re- uh, management. Oh, okay. All right. Do you guys do the? Uh, and there's probably a more sho- a better term than what I'm going to use, but the shocking where you, you do the studies where you you know go in areas and shock the fish or surveys. I think is the t- what it's called. It, we do. That's our major tool for for doing our sport fish surveys. That is correct. How, how often do you do those? Um, well, we do them every year, but I try to get to every reservoir every other year. So the last time I was on Gunnersville was the spring of 2021. And so this year I'm on Wheeler and Pickwick. Um, I do Wilson and Gunnersville on the odd years, Pickwick and Wheeler on the even years. And then I also have the four Bear Creek development lakes, too. So I have eight reservoirs um, that we survey every other year, basically. Okay. So you'll be back on Gunnersville next year. And next, Well, this fall for crappie and next spring for bass. That's correct. Okay. Do the results from that get put anywhere online? Um, they do once they've gone through the screening process. Which? So, okay, go ahead. The, the data and report for 2021 has not been has not been gone through the review committee down in Montgomery to date. Yeah. Now, now Phil, I, I seem to recall like a bait or something like that. A, a bait program is that still something that that's put on by the state? Uh, I think yeah. I generally see game wardens doing that kind of thing, but you know, at the boat ramp, just taking up quick survey questions, that kind of thing. Well. No, the game wardens don't do that. But we, there, there's two programs. You, you might be mixing up a couple of them with each other. Mm-hmm. We do a creel 
survey at the boat ramp ah. um, during the spring, not every other year, but every fourth year. So we'll we'll have somebody at various access areas on the reservoir on a weekend day, either Saturday or Sunday, and they will interview the anglers as they come off the water to find out what they're catching, what they're fishing for, what they're catching, what size fish they're catching, what they're keeping, and get an idea of harvest rates. We get an idea of effort by doing that. We get an idea of where they're coming from, um, some demographics, and so that gives us an idea of, of the quality of the fishing and uh, and the amount of harvest and uh, and well basically the catch rates is does that information in conjunction go with the uh, with the shock survey kind of thing yeah that's all included in that report when when it is submitted that is correct um, very little harvest um, takes place on Gunnersville even though we get a lot of reports from people saying that all of these out-of-state people are harvesting all the bass. <laughs> We get very, very, very little harvest of fish um, on those surveys. Wow. G- Gunnersville's an interesting lake to me. I- I've fished it pretty much my whole life. I'm 47 uh, in two weeks. and uh, um, Yeah, we're yeah, pushing that. I've, I've, I've seen a lot of swings up and down on that. It, 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 what... <laughs> It's spawn related, really, isn't it? Is, is that really the? I think recruitment's the term that I've heard some biologists use. But uh. well, the Tennessee River has variable recruitment. So one year you may have you know good spawns, another year not so much. But but that's really not the most important thing. The most important thing is how many of that spawn survived their first winter. That's the that's the kicker right there. Is how many of those fish that were spawned in the spring, make it through the first winter. Um, if they can make it through the first winter, then they have a much better chance of surviving to adulthood. Um, so, for instance, let's say you have a, you, you might have a bang-up spawn one year. You know, thousands and thousands, well, millions, really, of fish are everywhere along the bank of these little baby bass. Well, they're going to all compete with each other. So even though you got a lot, maybe not so many will survive you know, through that first winter because they're competing with each other. But you might have one year where you don't have a very good spawn, and so there's less competition, so more will survive. So basically the the, the fertility of the reservoir dictates how many fish will survive. The biomass, if you've heard the biomass term before. Sure. That, what, that's what controls how many pounds of fish you have out there. Do you think that eelgrass has improved – the environment for that. Oh, oh, yeah. Anytime you got vegetation, whether it's eelgrass or milfoil or hydrilla, it it's it's good for it's good for you know reproduction, um, nursery areas, um, holding forage fish. It doesn't matter what type of vegetation it is. Now the anglers will care about what vegetation. <laughs> yeah, take that eelgrass back. <laughs> really don't. <laughs> Bring me some hydrilla. <laughs> what I mean, is there any one thing you could point to to, you know, just that would st- the pro- proliferation of the eelgrass out here? I mean, we've just No. No. There's there's never one thing. It's it's a combination of things and it is mostly just mother nature. So it's just a natural, it's just going to take its cyclical course and, and move through. The native and, the plant, it's going to have, it's going to have, you know, a better chance of survival than, than, than a lot of plants, um, hydrilla and, and milfoil. But as they, you know, as they treat some plants, other plants may take, take over um, and, you know, take its place. But it's just kind of a natural cycle of things to ebb and flow and and increase and decrease. That's just mother's, you know, mother nature's way of doing things. Yeah, it, it's for sure. I mean, you know, when it first showed up, it was just in clumps. Yeah. You, you know, with with today's technology, you can look out there and see what's out there. You know, and it, and you know there would be just clumps of it, and then you could see the other grasses on each side. It was a hydrilla or milfoil, or whatever. And and when it was clumpy. It was fantastic. Right. It was. I loved it. Now that it's carpet, not so much. Uh, and, and and you know you can fish it. It's the floating part that's become a real issue. 
But, uh, you, that's exactly right. Yeah, the broken part that's floating at the surface that gets caught in your line and then goes down to your lures. Yeah, it can be a problem. Yeah, I've I've been out there. I've I've witnessed it. Yeah, and, and you see a lot of it just floating with root balls. Uh, I mean, it's almost like it's turned loose or. Uh, I don't know if that's, you know, from floods or, or what the case. I You know, obviously. Uh, Probably prop, props going through shallow water, kick it up and deroot it, and, and it floats down, and they can get reestablished somewhere else. Wheeler, for instance. Wheeler's got it now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've, heard, uh, I've heard the nuclear plants loving that over there. <laughs> it, it just I'm seems... Sure. You know, you see acres of it floating down the river now. It's uh, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, they've got that barge down there to deflect current, you know. Hmm. I haven't been on Whaler this year. That's, I've never been a fan. Tom Tom used to fish it a lot. But uh, uh, are, are you a fisherman as well? Yeah, I try to be. <laughs> try, try to be. <laughs> that's, that's kind of the way I feel about it sometimes, right. too. So, Pass fish. I've, you know, I've, I coached the Hartsville High School fishing team some. Oh, yeah. My boys. My boy fished on it, and I, I've been a part of, part of different clubs, bass clubs over the years. Yeah, so yeah, I like to fish. I don't get to do it as much as much as I like. Do any of us? Do any of us? Yeah, <laughs> I still like a lot. Yeah, um, that's how I got into it. You know, that's that's how most of us guys get into the field is because of our love for fishing. Right, right. You just loved it. Say, so, uh, how long have you how long have you worked for the state as a fisheries biologist? over 32 years now 32 years you got retirement in your eyes it's into my eyes yeah it's in my eyes you're thinking about it thinking about it so um about a little bit more every year i still got a young i got a young boy he's gonna be a gonna be a junior in high school so i've got to i've got to get him you know situated a little bit into college or out of college so oh yeah well you know now you can just get you a scholarship about fishing (laughs) college Hopefully he'll get those anyway. But there you go. Um, still costs money. Trust me. Yeah, it still costs money. Tom just graduated one a couple of years ago. I've got one going next year. So and and one a pretty good ways behind him. So I'm a the retirement is not anywhere even in in my near future. So hey, uh, you I got part? one at Michigan State right now, and so he's he's on scholarship, but he still got food and board. So oh yeah, yeah. Hey Phil, you you'd mentioned uh, earlier, you know, on the sport fish management side of it, some crappie and things like that. And I know that that crappie is a is another species that's near and dear to a lot of us. But uh, it, it just seems like Guntersville's been had some fantastic years of crappie. I mean, just really big, healthy fish. I mean, is that kind of the same thing you've seen in your surveys here? You know, oh, the yeah. most recent. You know, it, it's it's kind of funny. Gunnersville is known for its bass, but its crappie and catfish is probably as good as the bass fishing when it comes down to it. Oh, look, that, it. Oh, not that many people travel to crappie crappie fish, but it's uh, getting yeah. bigger. Yeah. It, oh yeah. Yeah, I know. It's fantastic crappie fishing. It really has been, and uh, you know, gosh, I mean, we just try to do our best to protect the environment. I mean, that's our big deal. Just save the resource. Well, you know when. When you got when you got the forage base and the and the aquatic vegetation, you know that benefits all species, not just bass. Sure. So, you know when you got when you got the thread and gizzard shad out there like we do, and the, and the really good brim populations, that's just food for all those other. Well, you know, you know uh, I, I hear fishermen say all the time, you know, uh, well, what we really need is a real cold snap to kill off a bunch of shad. Uh, is that a good thing? Do you feel like that's a that's something that, without a shad kill, you know, without those prolonged cold temperatures, without that shad kill, that that's good for the fishery, or does that do you think that negatively impacts it? It's good for the angler because they're not competing against natural forage. That's the only reason that would be good. Right. Yeah, it's always better after you know the, the after spring after the, a shad kill. Right. Than, yeah, when the bass have all of that forage out there, it's hard to compete with that, with artificial bait, you know? Sure. You know, they, they know the difference between a real thread fin and a crank bait, you know, or a swim bait. Um, but if that thread fin's not there, they're more likely to hit that crank bait or or, or swim bait. And so, yeah, the, your catch rates might go up, but is that best for the fish? No. 
I don't know that we've had a big shad kill, and I mean, it's you know, been quite a few. Years. It didn't get cold this winter till I mean, heck, it was seventy degrees at Christmas. But you know, in January it got a little cool, uh, and and it stayed February for a couple of months. Seemed like yeah, we just didn't have that long, that long, you know, cold snap. You know, yeah, you got to get weeks. those temperatures down there around thirty five or below for for a fair, fairly good period of time before it's really going to knock those threadfin shad out. 30 so anything so the water temp needs to get 35 or below for a while yeah it's got to stay cold for quite a while yeah yeah, yeah we we haven't had uh we we hadn't had that kind of cold it's messed up my no. duck hunting too i wish i wish it got cold again where the ducks would show up um yeah. so do you guys pay much attention to the shell crackers bluegill that kind of stuff or is it just uh mostly um, bass and crappie we don't go out of our way to manage them. They kind of self-manage themselves. There's really nothing we can do, you know, to 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 help them much. I mean, you can put size limits on them, or or you know, change the creel limits. But that's that's about our limit as far as what we can do with the brim. Right. Um. So you and I mentioned this briefly once when we talked several weeks ago, kind of talking about you coming on here. But uh, you know, there's a lot of folks that that want to stock the lake and a lot of it's my experience from several years ago most of the fisheries folks in your position don't feel that it's that beneficial if at all what what's your opinion on that well when 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 you got a naturally reproducing population of largemouth bass like we do on Gunnersville and anywhere else in the reservoirs across the state of alabama there's no need for stocking you cannot stock enough fish in a reservoir to outcompete the natives to make a difference. You just you're just going to end up wasting your money. Um, for instance, we did a bass spawn check on Gunnersville last spring, and and we averaged about 20 fingerling bass per 15 foot seine haul. Hmm. So if you if you calculate you know, expand that number out across the shoreline of the reservoir. It's millions of fish. That's yeah, sixty-nine thousand so, acres. So, hmm. folks, folks putting their money together at a dollar to two dollars a piece for a hundred thousand largemouth bass are basically wasting their money because now you got to introduce this hatchery produced fish that has no idea how to survive in the wild. He's been fed food at the hatchery. And and now you throw him out there, and he's got to learn the environment. He's got to he's got to he's got to worry about predi- being a, eaten by everything out there. He's got to, and then he's got to compete with all those native fish that are out there. It's just very hard for those hatchery reared fish to do to do anything. Is there any way to really measure that? Like I, I know the one the people I've heard talk about it are trying. Is it, I think tiger bass maybe the right, one they, right, they're trying yeah. to introduce. You know, just trying to get genetics out there, and you know, you hear genetics in deer herds and other things. Fish with the numbers that you're talking about, you're putting fifty thousand yeah, fish in a with millions and millions. You can't. Those can you even make a difference about. there? I mean, that's really, you know, they're trying to introduce that faster growing genetic. I know there's places that say that it works in some of these other lakes, but, you know, I don't know. It does work. And we've done it at Gunnersville, and that's why we got the fish when we do. We've stocked mm. hundreds of thousands of Florida strand largemouth bass out there, and we did that in the 90s. And those fish have incorporated that Florida gene into the population. So now that you catch a largemouth bass, that that fish is roughly 30 to 34, 35 percent Florida already in it. So you can stock the you can stock the Florida strain bass out there, but you're not going to get that hybrid vigor anymore because in order to get that hybrid vigor, you got to have a Florida strain spawned with a northern strain, and then you get that hybrid vigor. But a Florida strain stocked with a 34 percent or 35 Florida strain, yeah does not give you that vigor anymore. So we cannot incorporate that tiger bass because that's what a tiger bass is, 50% of each. And that's why it's got that hybrid hybrid vigor. But it's only got that hybrid vigor that one year. You wow. know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. Right. So, so in the 90s, 
we put Florida bass in scattered areas around the lake, I guess. Is that right? Mostly we, we did it in North Salty. Right. Roughly 400,000 went into North Salty, and those fish have been carried around the reservoir now for years um, by anglers. Right. You know, catch a fish in North Salty and they carry it somewhere else, now that fish has got those genes somewhere else. And those genes have spread around the reservoir. That Florida gene has spread around the reservoir so that roughly 34% of the fish, or not 34% of the fish, the fish has 34% Florida gene in it. Does that now, number continue? 20 to percent in some fish, but on an average, each bass is roughly 34% Florida. Over time, does that number, well, I mean, if they're all 34% Florida, which in theory, then then I guess over time the, the percentage doesn't dwindle. But if, if it, you know, if, if they're still just just northern strains running around, I guess over time you could, that number could get less. It could if it was, if they would spawn with northern strains, yeah, yeah, but then you'd still then you'd still get some hybrid vigor if, if there is any pure northern strain out there. And from our genetic studies, there is not. How long from a, a bass is born in May? Yes, in the spring. How, how, how long before that fish spawns? Um, it could potentially spawn that first year if it's got good growth, but year two. Two. But it takes. Four years to get to 15 inches. Four years, roughly, to get to 15 inches. So, okay. So so at year one, I mean, that's six-inch fish, in it? I, I mean. Year one, yeah. Yeah, it'll be, I would like to think it's bigger than that. Right. It, and that's all based on the forage that's out there. You know, the shad spawn, the brim spawn. Um, what, what about crawfish? What type of impact? Do, I mean, do you see... Uh, you know, big spawn years for crawdads that uh, that may impact uh, the way those fish are. I don't know if it's it's more protein Maybe. or whatever the case. You definitely got more crawfish out there with the vegetation because because they're veget they're vegetarians. Sure. So they like they like all the all the weeds. Right. Um, as far as the density of crawfish, I have no idea what Gunnersville has as far as the density of crawfish. Uh, there's certain yeah. times of year, yeah, which is most of the year, that a jig is a really, really, really good bait on Gunnerful. So yeah, yeah, uh, but I don't, I don't know what percentage. Oh sure, you know, sure. What percentage of their diet is, is crawfish? I couldn't tell you that. Yeah, and that may be seasonal. It seems like certain times of year. They, yeah, I mean they throw them up in the live well more certain times of year. So, um, I think I think it's more dependent on your threadfin shad. You do. You think you think threadfin is the prominent forage on on tennessee yeah. river yeah and then as bass get bigger you know they're going to be more dependent on on the bigger brim and the, and the gizzards yeah. the gizzards yeah yeah you can't grow a big fish on thread fin now you can grow a lot of three to five pounders on thread fin but once you get to five pounds you, you get you got to get something that's worth their worth their effort that, you know, that makes sense. Catch, it's you know, yeah. So they got to catch something that's big enough that they're not expending more calories than what they're getting in return. So that's why a big fish has got to chase big baits, like those slow moving swim baits. Yeah, yeah, big bull shads and stuff like right, that. Right, right. Uh, it, uh, it it seems like, and and I don't do your when you you say you do your studies in the spring, like during the spawn time when trying to get a lot of fish up shallow. Is that kind of the way that works? We try to do it in April when the fish have moved from the deep water up shallow to spawn. That um, that that's easiest for us because we're we're limited we're limited the depth of water we can work in. Maybe eight foot. It's about as deep as we can go with our electrofishing units. Right. So, you know, we got to get along a, a nice bank with a forty five degree slope and and try to trap fish between the bank and the boat in about eight foot of water or less. Well, look, let me ask a spawn question here. Uh, so, when the fish are when the fish have moved in, or you know, and it's getting to that time, you're getting some longer days, and some warmer water, that kind of thing, and then uh, TVA drops the bottom out of the, the lake. Does do those fish just pick up, move out to a deeper location, and and continue to spawn, or is that just ruin their their home? No, there, there's probably some that are va- vacated. And you might lose a few beds, 
But in the big picture, it has no effect on the population. The bass and the bat, the largemouth bass will spawn anywhere from the, towards the end of March all the way through June. So you have a real long extended spawn wow. in, in this country. And, and that, so and so it, it has no effect. Now, you know, like I said, some some beds might get vacated, but in the big picture, it has no effect on the population. Now, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but won't a largemouth bass spawn more than once in the spring? Uh, the female... Yes. The female can eggs in, in more than one bed. That that is correct. And sometimes they can do a fall spawn. Believe it or not. Hmm. You know, I've I've caught some fish in, in odd times of the year that just appeared to be, you know, on the spawn or you know a bloody tail that kind of thing. And you're thinking, wow, is this fish really spawning this late? But uh, I've just it's been my experience that they could do it about any time. I guess. Yeah the 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 Florida the Florida strain largemouth. Have a tendency to do a fall spawn. I did not. Not all. Wow. Times, yeah. I, I had no idea that was a thing. So, now, whether whether their uh, whether their uh, fry survive is you know another question. That's, yeah, that's a whole other story. Yeah. yeah, the ones in Florida it doesn't get it's not supposed to get cold down there, but we're not in Florida anymore. So. Right. Those those fall spawn fish would be very small through the winter, and you know. The chances of them surviving are pretty slim. It'd be a tough winter, Tom. Yeah, I want to ask you. Uh, fucking eat them, you know. Yeah, yeah. I want to ask you one other, another question that that gets asked a lot, and rumors get spread around on uh, on Gunnersville uh, uh, about gill nets. Um, I know they're legal. Well, most of them out there are legal. I think they have laws they're supposed to follow. Um, there are those people that believe that those have a big impact, particularly in certain creeks where they put them in bottlenecks where everything that swims through there gets in them. And it's going to have an impact on the, in their opinion, on the higher older class fish for, you know, the little ones can swim through, but the bigger, what, what's your opinion on that? Well, I, I've done some gill netting. It's one of our survey gear. One of our, you know, it's just one of the methods that we survey, especially striped bass and sauger. And we very, very, very seldom catch largemouth bass in our gill nets. I'm not saying they don't catch them, but it's very, very, very rarely. Right. And, and when and when you do, you can you can pop that fish out of the net and it will swim off. Yeah, it, as long they, as they that. will pass. You know, I'd be a liar to say they wouldn't. But I'll tell you this: if you didn't have those those gill nets out there removing rough fish, um. There would be a lot more rough fish out there. Have you seen? And, speaking of that, what what about these uh, these carp? Oh, the Asian carp. Yes, they're, yes, they're coming. Yep. It's just nothing we can do about it, is there? Well, there's something we can do about it, but it's a slow process. And right, and you know that's what I would recommend instead of people spending a hundred thousand dollars on largemouth bass fry, is start developing some some program where they can put that money towards Asian carp work. What can we do? Yeah, that, that's a good question. <laughs> you know, we can't accept any money. Right. So so it, it would have to be some private organization um, pooling their, their resources and working through some other program to, to, to get it done. The, the thing that's, that really needs to get done is – these barriers at these dams got to get got to get installed, and barriers are, are what we call a bioacoustic fence, fish fence, right. BAF, and they're a sound barrier, a light barrier, and a bubble barrier, and and all together they they work pretty good for for keeping carp from going through the locks, Asian carp. So. Mm. And this is speculation on your part. You know, we, we, we're most people that fish are familiar with what happened at Kentucky Lake, and and I'm hearing that that the bass is is coming back some up there. Um, do, but now Kentucky Lake didn't have grass and stuff like we have. Do you think that the habitat that we have on Gunnersville or even Wheeler now, for that matter, uh, is going to have make the impact from those Asian carp be different, or is it all about them just eating too much of the food chain? They just. They're just they're filter feeders. They're feeding on phytoplankton. They don't care about vegetation. They just want green water, basically. Right. Um, 
the greener the water, more phytoplankton's in the water, the better they can swim and, and feed. They're, they're the going to work. Same thing. They're going to work their way up the river. And that's Whether the stuff that the thread, that the thread fans, fans eat, right? So that's the real deals. It's upsetting the the food chain. Not only a thread fin, but all fish at some point in their life stage rely on phyto and zooplankton. Even bass. After the bass uh, break up from their schools, they're feeding on zooplankton. And that's what these Asian carp feed on. So, and it's just a sheer volume deal. Like up there, at, I've seen some graph right. pictures of people's graphs from up there at uh, at Kentucky Lake where it's just millions, I mean, or thousands in the picture. You know, it's just ridiculous. Yep, they just overwhelm the whole system um, by eating the basis of the food chain. Whew. We, yeah. we, we got we, we, we got some I, work to do then. I, I, I know they're on Pickwick. I mean, I, I, I've, I've been told, and people have shown videos, and I don't know to what extent. You, you know, and but. they're increasing in numbers on Pickwick, and they're working their way up the river. I mean, it, there's been one in Tennessee. Oh, I don't remember if it's Nick or Jack or. I, mm. I actually saw something about that, but uh, um, it's up. It's anywhere in between you know now are these fences uh is that something that's in the works now they have an experimental one below barkley that they're they're testing and it seems to be working pretty good so when the funding is there and they've, they're done with their their you know testing and research hopefully they'll start prioritizing some of these other dams like like wilson dam and maybe to keep them out of Mississippi and the and and the rest of Alabama. Um, what's that? What's that lake there on on the Ten Tom Tennessee Waterway? Um, that first dam going down the Ten Tom Waterway. Yeah, I can't remember the name of it, but uh, Bay Springs. I'm sorry. Yeah. For some reason, I couldn't remember that. But Bay Springs, they need one there, and then they need one at every other block too. You know. Um, I think this is just this is just my theory. Maybe I shouldn't even express it, but I think the reason they haven't progressed upstream of Wilson as much as they have is because of the of the way that dam is built. You got that long lock canal on the north side, and you got the generators on the south side, and there's no connection in between. So if the fish is following the flow, it's going to go up to the generators, and it's not going to go to the lock where it can go through. So I, I think that's probably been been beneficial to some extent is just the way that's configured. Yeah, that's that's the only one that's built that way right here, isn't it? Yeah. It's really, got its own, really, yeah. So yeah, Where there's a barrier between the you know, So that's basically what happens. When the locks open, the fish swim in. and. Yep, that's the only way they can upstream is through the lock so if you can keep them from going into that lock canal then you're going to keep them from going upstream so that's i mean that's where the fence is going basically under the water it, it, clearly it doesn't go to the surface because the barges and boats have to get through there but i'm guessing that those fences have several commas in their price tag oh yeah 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 they're not cheap so yeah it just goes on the bottom of of wherever you put it and then it has light shooting up, and it has bubbles bubbling up, and it has that sound. And these these invasive carp are really sensitive to certain frequencies of sound, <laughs> and other fish aren't. So it deters the carp, the invasive carp, but not the but but not the other fish. Yeah, that's interesting. How, how much travel do you think there is between dams? I, I have my theories for other reasons, but, you know, bass, bait, whatever. I mean, you know, bass chase a ball of bait into a lock. It opens up, then they come out the other side. I mean, it happens, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I You know, I don't think bass travel through them all that much, but um, but these carp, we've, we've radio tagged several of them on Pickwick, and they've, they've, made, their, they've made migrations all the way down to – to Kentucky Dam and Barkley Dam and back. Oh, so mackerel. Fish are, are quite mobile. Right, you know. For whatever paddle, reason. Something like that might be mobile and catfish might be somewhat mobile. I don't think I don't think bass travel through the through the locks all that much. Do you think that any of these strong floods we've had in the last several years in the springs could relocate fish over, you know, 
down, blow them down the creek, so to speak, and put them over the dam? If you got if you got really strong flow over the spill gates, so that it's not such a huge drop, um, right. the Tennessee River is pretty high, so I don't think you're going to get I don't think you're going to get much over the Tennessee River dams as far as fish going downstream or or able to swim up through the floodgates. Yeah, I mean more like washed over versus coming up, you know. But yeah, you know, going going down river instead of up. But uh, river is, is where we want them to go, so let them. You know. Oh yeah, yeah, right. I, I I was just curious to your opinion on that. I mean, there's some folks that think Wheeler got good because the uh, extreme flooding. Wheeler got good quickly. You know, the last few years it just made a big comeback, and oh. that, that that some of them think some of the Gunnersville fish made their way that way just because we've had such big floods the last few years. I think Wheeler just producing its own fish. Yeah, and and you the grass the, put the a grass. Touch. Yeah, I would think the grass would really improve that fishery over there for sure. Well, and it yeah. got them from being suspended somewhere. It gave them a place to call home to make right. them a little more catchable. And I, I haven't been there, but I, and I heard the grass wasn't as good this year as it was last year. But uh, uh, you know, gra- grass, the quantity of grass is is dictated by the by the flow and the color of the water. So if you got high muddy water, you're gonna have less grass growing that year. That's right. Just, that's other nature. Right. Except on Gunnersville, where you can't do anything to get rid of this stupid eelgrass, <laughs> <laughs> and it's clear. Yeah, it, it's definitely so it's, clear. Tennessee River's pretty clear reservoirs altogether, all of them. You know, pretty good water quality, really. And and I think it's clearer than it used to be. And, and oh, yeah, Wilson, Wilson, Pickwick, Wilson, always vegetation for that too. Yeah, yeah. Do we have any issues with the? Uh, oh crap! I just went blank on the name. The uh, the little snails, what are they called? Uh, snails is not the right word, but we had uh, we had an uh, had an invasive issue that was oh. getting on some of the shell beds. And oh, zebra mussels. Zebra mussels. Yes. So, yeah, I haven't heard. I don't deal with those at all, but I haven't heard that that's really been a problem at all. Well, I remember, you know, for years there were mussel divers out everywhere, and you know, you just don't. I guess that's a die a, a, a dying breed. Yeah. yeah, you don't see those guys out anymore, but you still find mussel beds. So. Yeah, that's because the Japanese quit buying the mussel. Is that what the market just went away? Yeah. Market went away. Yeah, yeah. The mussels are there. You know those those big those big uh, washboard um, mussels are still there. It just there's just no market for them. So. Do y'all do many studies on mussels on on the river, or do you just fish? We have a malacologist, um, a state malacologist. Um, studies snails and mussels, but he's he's primarily working on snails now, um, just just because of the supply and demand thing. Right, right, right. I just you know it's, it seems to me like the the, you know, the shell beds get hot when the water gets to seventy something, and then it's got to do with the bait and the fish coming out. And then as it gets hotter in the summer, to me they kind of move back to the grass. So, right, uh, just normal patterns on Gunnersville, I guess you could say. So. Well, here lately, I, I think, you know, after the brim spawn, I mean, there's been a lot of fish in the grass as well. So, Well, Phil, I could probably pick your brain with a million different things over time. I really appreciate you taking a few minutes of your time to come on here and share some information. And um, Well, we let me let me touch on the gill nets. Sure. Second, because I, I didn't finish my comment about the gill nets. Um, but gill nets remove a lot of rough fish. And that opens up a niche for any other species to fill. Um, so game fish can, you know, by the removal of rough fish, you have the potential of increasing your game fish population. So, so you're saying that that uh, a, just a carrying capacity of the of the water that, that taking yep. taking a bunch of big carp out opens up a space for something else to to be part. Of. Let's hope it's not Asian carp. Let's hope it's green fish. We like bass. Right. So. <laughs> oh, uh, different, different specific level of, of what they feed on, but uh, but yeah. Hey, Tom just brought up something uh, that that I'd meant to ask, and it may just be coincidental, but something that several of us have noticed over the last few years on Gunnersville is a large increase in spotted bass and some good ones. Yeah, did, some nice size did, fish. Do you have any input into that? Yeah, that's kind of the way these spotted bass go. <laughs> <laughs> If you don't like them, well, eat them. That's, no. <laughs> eat, uh, that's why we don't put size limits on them. We we want people to to take them really, really. And most 
Kentucky spotted bass now have some type of uh, Alabama bass genetics in them. So they aren't pure northern spots anymore. They're they're Alabama bass, a lot of them. Like a Coosa like River? Yeah. Yep, yep, and, and they're they're very they're very hardy and will spawn with just about everything. So they could they could hurt your smallmouth population, they'll hurt your northern spotted bass population. Um, they don't spawn very readily with largemouth, but uh, but the Alabama bass will spawn with just about everything, and and that waters down your genetics. So so what so, you're okay. saying is we need to eat some spots, and the gill nets opening up space for something else in the waterway. The spots may be filling that right now just because of, they'll mate with anything. <laughs> <laughs> But they they do that. like clearer, you know, better better quality water than uh, the largemouth do, and and so when the water quality gets good, spotted bass numbers a lot of times increase. Yeah. yeah so that leads us to believe that the Gunnersville water quality is pretty good right now. Yeah, I mean, if they, you know, if they get pretty good size, that that's not so bad. But a lot of times, the spotted bass will. Get about ten, twelve inches, and that's about it. Do they just grow slower? Um, I wouldn't say they grow slower. They just don't have the genetics for getting all that big. Right, right. They're just not made to be five, six, seven pounds. So, right. So, well, That'd Phil, be a trophy for sure. Oh man, yeah, and mean. So, and I one other question, and then I'm and I'm gonna be done. But uh, smallmouth. Gunnersville's never been known as a smallmouth lake, but they do exist, particularly on the upper end, you know, above B.B. Comer and and, yep. and down around the dam in places. They're pretty nomadic. Do you think those things come through the dams, and, and do you think the smallmouth population on Gunnersville is increasing, or do you ever see any of that? I, I, I think it's pretty steady. I, yeah. I think, you know, it's just not smallmouth habitat, except for those areas you just mentioned. Right. Those rocks. Bluffy, riverine areas are, are are pretty good for smallmouth, but the rest of the reservoir is not. So, um, I think it's just a steady po- steady holding population. Yeah, um, I don't think it's increasing or decreasing. In other words, Kay Donaldson that that runs the Alabama Bass Trail got pretty upset earlier this year when they, they allowed them to lock through the wheeler. That was their deal. But but the guy, and if it hadn't, if the flood hadn't messed him up, the the a guy was he, fixing, won. he was about to win it, uh, locking through and catching smallmouth below the dam and bringing them back to Gunnersville, you know, to yeah, Goose Pond. And uh-huh. she, she got upset about them. That was not the Alabama Bass Trail that did that, though. It was the no, pro, it, it was it, she was upset about it. It was one of the it was pro Toyota. It wasn't. was the Toyota series. Yeah, the Toyota series allowed them to lock through. And but Kay was upset because they were taking the wheeler fish, the smallmouth, and, and bringing them to Gunnersville, where they would not probably spawn. What, do, you, do you think that's the case? Do you think they turned around, and went home? What, what do you think? I think they found some place to spawn. You yeah. do. You think they'll just move to the right? They'll move around till they find suitable habitat, whether it's up, down, or whatever. They they can find it anywhere up and down that river. Right, right. Yeah, there's a yeah. bluff right above Goose Pond. You know, that probably five fish a day. You know, that's, that's right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You're looking at he he had what three days? It was a four day tournament, and day four it got blown out. Right. I mean, right. the water level came up six or eight feet yeah. right there. But uh, uh, so yeah, I mean, you, and then there was a few other people. But overall, you're still looking at this 15 if there was 10 I mean, it's less than 100 fish. You, you know. And, oh yeah. And, and uh, so I guess in the grand scheme of things, that doesn't make that much difference, does it? No, no, not in the big picture. Um, but, you know, if, if the tournaments would would just write it in their tournament rules that there's no locking through, you you wouldn't have to worry about all that stuff. Yeah, I'm not sure why they did that. I, I, I think it was a participation thing right at the end, but I, then again, yeah. I'm not an authority on that. So. No, it, uh, they, uh, um, do you believe that the what, – what, what's your opinion on mortality – of fishing tournaments, particularly yeah, latent mortality, yeah, yeah, delayed mortality after it gets hot and stuff like that. I think it's way higher than people want to want to admit to. Do you really? Yeah, we you, don't. Yeah. We don't. Have any, we don't have any solid proof. I mean, we've held fish after tournaments, um, especially spotted bass. They don't do worth a flip. Yeah, you know, we have some spot tournaments. Eight <laughs> percent plus of your tournament fish on a hot day for spotted bass. Um, you know, your overall mortality in Gunnersville is roughly 35%. That's 
that's natural mortality, including fishing mortality. That's total mortality. Right. Uh, you know, so if you're looking at half of that being fishing mortality and half of that being natural mortality, it's probably not going to So you're saying a year? I mean, an average? The whole. But when, when your fishing mortality starts starts increasing more than your natural mortality, that's when you got to really start worrying about it. And so far, we haven't had to worry about it on, on our reservoirs. Right. Yeah. I mean, Gunner, Gunnersville's gone through a bunch of cycles. Uh, I mean, do you think that three fish tournament limits, uh, other than just being only three fish instead of five, reduces the mortality rate? I mean, having three oh, yeah. fish in the live well versus five? Oh, for sure. Yeah. And not holding them during the summertime would help a lot more. But yeah. anytime you reduce the number of fish people are holding in their live well, that's two fish that, that have gone free immediately so that's 40 percent right there you know is there a certain water uh-huh. temperature you believe is the is the the point that it just gets too hot the oxygen level's too low in the water or whatever well yeah i think anything over 80 degrees you start stressing fish 80 yeah yeah no. so ice, ice works but then people don't know how to use the ice you know you can you can you can get the fish too cold too. You want you want to maintain that water temperature about eight five to ten degrees, you know, below what what the what the river temperature is. And if you ex, if you go above that, you can temperature shock them too. Right. If you throw them, take them out of eighty degree water and throw them in sixty. I, they, I've they, seen they, some crazy methods for, yeah. and uh, I, I think yeah. simple is best. But well, Phil, ninety water. To 80 degree water is about the limit you know you'd want to go um but warm water just does not hold as much oxygen and so you you gotta you gotta cool it down a little bit uh but you gotta have good aeration in your boats you know right good aerators oxygenators there's all kinds of tools they put aerators, in there yep recirculate that water instead of pumping new water in right right Good advice. Very good, very good. And yeah, I, it's I used to fish this time of year, and I'm too old, and I don't care about the heat anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I just like yeah, the- I don't like those I like those tournaments this time of year when it's well this year especially when it's so warm so early. Um, yeah, it's it's not a good practice to to have tournaments. And and outside of the little local wildcats, there that's got you know ten boats in it. There's not much going on this year, particularly in June. I'm yeah, gonna, it seems like things have really slowed down uh, into and, the and, summer. You still go to those live to the to the weigh-ins, and people are people don't put enough water in their bags, and then they're too heavy, and they let them on a hundred and twenty degree pavement. It drives me crazy. I agree. It just yeah. I wish there was a way to just bring a little common sense into fish care. Fish. Or, you know. fish on the water and let them go <laughs> right you just some people just don't care you know i mean that's just True. the way it is some of them don't think about it you're right it's heavy they set them on the hot pavement it's it's a it's a bad deal it's 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 a bad deal so well phil we're gonna wrap it up uh, i sure do appreciate you taking a few minutes to come on it took us a little bit of time to get it all lined up and uh, it's probably been a month since i talked to you the first time but uh, yeah. uh i i uh hope to have you back on uh soon and you know oh where can we find those results when they do get the fishery results from a year ago when they do get posted? Uh, yeah, yeah, you'll have to go to our outdooralabama.com, our website, and just follow the fingernails through there and, and uh, go to reservoirs, freshwater fishing reservoirs, and, and it should be in there. Okay. All right. Well, hey, I sure do appreciate it. You have a great day. Thank you very much. Thanks, Phil. Uh, See you guys. See you. Yep. Yeah, bye. Really appreciate Phil coming on. Uh, we could probably talk to him for two or three hours instead of 40 minutes. Just to, yeah, Man, great information. Yeah, lo- lots of information for us fishing nerds uh, to just kind of sit there and, and, and go through it. Um, not a lot going on tournament-wise other than your weekly Wildcat, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, Saturday. Uh, Sunday afternoon uh at browns they didn't have it this past week because of hydrofest i did not go to any of that there was boats running. stayed around. off the lake so yeah stayed somewhere. away from that uh this weekend fourth of july uh i'm gonna be there and i'm not gonna be fishing i'm gonna be acting like a fool with the rest of it <laughs> <So, laughs> uh and uh, I, I may fish a little bit early or late but um it's time to do it early very early or very very late 
Yep, yeah. The the uh, GTO says the big selling baits of the week, the last couple weeks, been big worms, swim baits, and flipping jigs. That flipping bite is probably where it's going to be from, particularly after ten o'clock in the morning, from here through. Oh, October, October, November. Yeah. You know, find those big clumps of hydrilla, millfoil, and there's fish. One of these other know, kinds. You know, we were talking about that floating grass. I mean, there's fish that are just hanging around those things. Yeah. It's really yeah. crazy. It's because the bait's hanging around. The them. bait is under them, and every once in a while you see a fish blow up. The through fry it. is under them. Yeah. The fry is living in them really thick. And, and, uh, um, last time I was out was a Saturday afternoon. I'm ashamed to say it was about a week and a half ago. And, uh, um, there was, Floating grass everywhere. It was awful. Yes. But but everything that was blowing up was blowing up around the mats of floating stuff in 12 foot of water. Now, yeah. I, I was fishing grass. I was not on deep stuff. I was just on grass edges. But uh, everything that was eating was pretty high in the water column and coming up and eating eating little fry and uh, um, yeah, something eats the fry and something eats what is eating the fry, whatever. I but, think the last two weeks, the deepest we fished has been about 12 foot. Yeah. You had a good day on Speedworm. Yeah. 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 We did. Uh, really did. Um, which is probably also going to be a good bait from here on out yeah it, it's uh, it's the time it's, yeah it's time it, it, it is worms jigs I'd, i always like a green jig this time of year there's something in june about crawfish and and, and uh, should have been a good crawfish uh hatch uh, with the last uh full moon which 16th i think 15th like 15th and there's been a blue million willow flies oh yes uh, uh that may have been willow flies your line but wouldn't go through I, versus I, grass so the night. <laughs> i don't know if, if uh, bobo was around and those things still stung i mean uh, <laughs> uh, uh well this is gonna be our last episode for the season i hate that trey missed it although he's probably in 65 degree weather versus 90 like we are right now um we hope to be back in the spring. We're going to try to work some things out. Uh, Trey was planning on trying to come back. I might even get Tom back in here with me. He, he's, he's pretty good at no, this. I've enjoyed so. it. I've enjoyed he, it. He, he's always game to talk fishing. Um, or just talk. Or just talk. Or just talk. <laughs> so um, not a whole lot of other stuff going on. The, there, We may pop up and do a fall episode or two. Uh, there's there's a little bit of, you know, pretty good little activity, October, November. Um, I don't some fish much fish that time going. of year. I like to chase things i like to shoot ducks and deer and all kinds of that stuff but uh, tom fishes year round so just like trey so anyway thanks for listening uh we hope to be back uh in several months uh enjoy the floating grass (laughs) 